Hi there, everyone. If you want to come in and have a seat, please, we're going to get started. My name is Rebecca West. I'm the curator of the Plains Indian Museum and also the director of the Curatorial Education and Museum Services Divisions. And I want to welcome everybody and also make a note of thanks to our sponsors. We'd like to thank the Sage Creek Ranch and also the Nancy Carroll Draper Foundation for their generous support of these programs that have been going on all year. We've made it to September. I see a lot of familiar faces, and we thank you so much for your interest in this series. If you haven't already shut down your cell phone, please do so, so we can have a nice, quiet focus on our speaker. And it's always fun for me to introduce my colleagues, because while we think we know each other within this building, a lot of times we don't slow down to really appreciate and applaud each other's accomplishments. Our speaker today is Dr. Jeremy Johnston. He's got quite a few roles here at the center. He is the Hal and Naoma Tate Endowed Chair and Curator of Western American History. He's also the Ernest J. Goppert Curator of the Buffalo Bill Museum, as well as the Managing Editor of the Papers of William F. Cody. So what exactly do all these titles mean? Well, it means that while we don't always know exactly which project Jeremy is working on, we do know that it always adds to the wealth of knowledge to the center, but it also adds to the massive amounts of facts that are crammed in Jeremy's head. If you don't already know Jeremy, he's a Powell, Wyoming native. He's a University of Wyoming graduate, a former professor at Northwest College in Powell, and he recently received his doctorate from the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow, Scotland. He's a very accomplished author, scholar, and historian. I consider him our go-to guy for Western history, local history, and anything related to Buffalo Bill, but he's also admired for his role as a community member here in Cody and Powell, and also a keeper of local knowledge. He's great to work with because he keeps us thinking, he tells great jokes, and he never takes the last cup of coffee from the pot in the break room. Uh, and today, we're changing the focus a little bit. If you've been to previous lectures, you've heard from some paleontologists, archeologists, biologists. But today, we're going to shift to a historian. This topic really got my attention. It includes a president, Yellowstone National Park, political favors, and historic drama. Dr. Johnston will now present Theodore Roosevelt, the unscrupulous concessioner, and the insane adversary. Please welcome Jeremy. Thank you, Rebecca. I need to save that introduction and read that occasionally. So, and eventually I'll tell you who always takes the last cup of coffee. Yeah. I, I want to thank all of you for showing up this afternoon, and I, I do want to extend my thanks to the Draper Museum of Natural History for allowing a historian to sneak into one of these lunchtime expedition presentations. So uh, hopefully I'll throw a little bit of uh, wildlife studies in there to, to make it worth your while. I, I'd like to also thank all my fellow staff members here at the Center of the West, uh, especially those who work in the McCracken Research Library who have been a tremendous resource in providing some of the photos you'll see here today and some of the resources I've consulted for this, this project. I also want to thank my staff, so Sam Hanna, who's back there, and Linda Clark, who retired earlier this year. She joined us for the day. And Deb, would you stand up, Deb Adams? Oh, she's way in the back already standing. So Deb has been with me a very long time. Deb started with me when I was in grade school. Yes, I know I'm number one. I think that's the finger you're holding up there. But uh, anyway, uh, Deb has been with me since grade school. She was a teacher's assistant when I was a, a student struggling through elementary school. Uh, 
about eight years ago, eight, nine years ago, she started working with me with the papers of William F. Cody. And uh, Deb's last day will be Saturday. She's decided to retire. So if you would, please give Deb a round of applause for putting up with me for so long. <laughs> And Deb told me not to tell anyone that she's retiring, so please keep it a secret. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, today I want to look at three individuals. One that's well known, one that if you're from the local area you're probably familiar with and an individual that has really been lost to time that very few people know about. So uh, this, this topic first came about when I was working on my master's thesis. I was looking at Theodore Roosevelt's connections to Yellowstone National Park and his influence on the, the future management of Yellowstone. And I came across this book. It's called Autobiography of Roosevelt's Adversary by James Fullerton. And I'll talk about this book more as we get into the presentation. But uh, at the time when I was working on my master's thesis, I think that this book has some really interesting accusations against Roosevelt. And I contacted the park historian, Lee Whittlesley. I spoke to... Uh, Paul Shaleri, a well-known Yellowstone historian, and asked them if they were familiar with this account. And they basically said, you know, I wouldn't take it too seriously. I dismiss it. Uh, this guy is just kind of a crank. He was uh, really insane and didn't know what he was talking about. And so I think I put it in a footnote in my master's thesis and didn't think about it again until I came across one of these local Acadia publications with photos of the Bear Creek area, Bear Creek, Montana, and I saw a photograph of James Fullerton and his family, which said, okay, I've got to check this out a little bit more. Thankfully, due to all the new databases that provide access to newspaper accounts, I was able to find out a little bit more about Roosevelt's insane adversary. So anyway, the individual you probably know a lot about, Theodore Roosevelt, President of the United States. He was well-connected to Yellowstone National Park. This began when George Bird Grinnell, a naturalist, and Roosevelt formed the Boone and Crockett Club. The Boone and Crockett Club was really the first organization to fight for the protection of Yellowstone. And a number of successful accomplishments that really preserved the park that we know today. For example, they kept the railroad from building a line through the Larimar Valley from Gardner, Montana to Cook City. So imagine if you'd see that today, a railroad track going through that wonderful valley. When the railroad wasn't going to be built, the railroad company decided they would try to cut down the boundaries of Yellowstone. They would remove the northern section, and the Boone and Crockett Club effectively stopped that movement and kept the boundaries of Yellowstone intact. They also secured the real first enforcement of laws against poaching in Yellowstone National Park. And poachers are really decimating a lot of the park wildlife. The other thing that they really worked towards was promoting Yellowstone, bringing people's attention to the park, the, the problems that the management was facing. And at this point in time, Yellowstone was managed by the military. So the War Department had taken over Yellowstone in 1886, and it had been under the War Department since that point in time. So basically, soldiers patrolled the park. But anyway, Roosevelt and Grinnell were very advocates, uh, great advocates for the protection of Yellowstone. And as President of the United States, Roosevelt continued to ensure for the future protection of Yellowstone. Uh, he visited the park, the second president to visit the park in 1903, where he dedicated the arch that now bears his name, the Roosevelt Arch that welcomes you into the northern entrance of Yellowstone National Park. Some of you are probably familiar with this individual, Ella Collins Waters. Waters was described by Paul Shaleri as follows. Waters generally behaved in the manner of the worst stereotypes of the sleazy park concessionaire. 
Okay. Now, uh, Waters was one of the first concessionaires to get into Yellowstone. Uh, he had worked for the Yellowstone Park Association, which really held a monopoly in the park. And he worked with them for a while and created all sorts of problems. He was uh, known to soap the geysers. He'd throw soap into the geysers, which would change the dynamics of the water and cause these really uh, wild eruptions there. Of course, that is verboten. It messes with the plumbing of those hot springs and geysers. Uh, he was accused of keeping soldiers out of the Mammoth Park Hotel. Um, later, he left the association and started the Steamboat franchise. And many of you are familiar with this Steamboat concession that would take visitors from West Thumb to Lake. And they'd enjoy a nice scenic boat ride across Lake Yellowstone in this, this steamboat here. This is the, the Zilla. And then we'll talk about the one later on he brought in, the E.C. Waters that he named after himself. While managing the Yellowstone Lake Boat Company, Waters continued to behave badly. If you go to the Yellowstone archives in Gardner, there is a file that is literally this thick of complaints. People accusing him of all sorts of things. So for example, a number of his female employees accused him of holding them hostage. He would bring them into Yellowstone and say, I will pay for you to come work, and if you don't like it in the park, I'll pay for you to go back. And they would get here, and he'd say, I never agreed to pay for your return trip. You're stuck here for the duration. Some of the female employees he would take out for, for rides, and something would happen to the horse. I guess the wagon ran out of gas, and they'd be stranded alongside the lake and he'd start putting his arms around them and they'd have to defend their honor. Uh, other things he did, he would basically go around and he cut hay for his livestock whenever he felt like it, wherever he felt like it. And uh, one of the biggest complaints against Waters is he was charging very high rates for the rowboats that people could rent at lake and take out to the lake and go fishing or whatever on a pleasure row or whatever. But anyway, he would charge one rate. He charged one cheap rate to get you out in the middle of the lake, and then the rate to get back to shore was a lot higher. And you found out about that when you were inside the boat wanting to get back to the shoreline. So all these complaints start building up. Now, um, a lot of people thought Waters was untouchable. Some of the early acting superintendents, the military, tried to get rid of him. But one of the first that went after him was dismissed, and a lot of people believe the reason why he was let go is because Waters was connected to the Republican Party. He was good friends with President Harrison's son. And a lot of the military administrators thought this guy is untouchable. He can do whatever he wants to. And regarding the wildlife here, um, he was also accused, but never really, this was never proved against him, that he was running an illegal trapping business uh, through the lake company here, his boat company, and was basically selling furs on the side. But again, uh, no, one, no one was able to prove that against him. Now the guy that you probably never heard about, Roosevelt's adversary, James Fullerton. James Fullerton is an interesting individual, and he detailed his life experiences in his, his autobiography. Uh, his story is basically one of continual failure. Uh, this is a guy that started out in England. He was an early day poacher. He poached on many of the, the estates there throughout Britain. He eventually immigrated to Canada where he became part of the, the Mounties, the Northwest Mounted Police. Eventually he decided to homestead in Canada, that didn't quite work out, so he moved down to Texas with his family. His wife became sick, so he decided to move to Arkansas. They didn't like the bugs and the snakes, so they moved to Minnesota. From Minnesota, they moved to Laramie. They stayed there for a while and eventually homesteaded here in the Bighorn Basin near Tinsleep in what he described as some irrigation project. But basically, the story was always the same. Just right at the moment, they were starting to make it. They were going to have a successful farm. Something went wrong. One of the kids got sick. The wife got sick. 
and they ran out of money, they couldn't afford to pay their bills, and they had to pack up and leave. They had to take out of the territory and start all over again. So um, after living a while in Wyoming, he went to Colorado, worked for a photography shop, uh, where he learned to take some photographs, which he used to illustrate his autobiography. And then, after a while, left Colorado and came up to the Bear Creek Valley, just uh, outside of present-day Bear Creek, Montana, where they started a farm, a vegetable farm. Can you imagine that? A vegetable farm near Bear Creek. Who's been to Bear Creek? Okay. <laughs> yeah, there are not a lot of vegetable farms growing there anymore. But anyway, he and his family were selling vegetables to the markets in Red Lodge and doing a pretty good business. Yet there was a hint, and going through the newspapers, there was a hint that something wasn't quite right. Um, Fullerton published a notice in the Red Lodge Picket, their newspaper, and it basically said that any man who touched his daughter would not need to go through a trial because he would handle them personally. So there was evidence here that he, he had a violent side and was mistrusting of people and kind of an early day warning of what this guy would eventually uh, would do. But anyway, one day, Fullerton told everyone he was going to Washington, D.C., and he was going to lobby for an extension campus from Montana State University, university that would be set up near Bear Creek, Montana, some substation. He goes to Washington, D.C., and he comes back, and he tells the Red Lodge paper that he met with the president, and the president supported his idea, President Roosevelt, and so this was a done deal. However, along the way, from Washington, D.C. back to Montana, he was telling other reporters from various newspapers different stories. So he basically tells these reporters that he met with Roosevelt to draw attention to the mismanagement of Yellowstone National Park under Major Pitcher, the military superintendent at that point in time. He accused Pitcher of basically letting poachers run free in Yellowstone. And these poachers were decimating the park wildlife. They were being slaughtered. And it wouldn't be long before all the wildlife in the park would be gone. He accused Pitcher of grazing horses for his good friends on the best grazing land within the Yellowstone, which was stripping the grazing land that the bison were using. He accused Pitcher of misappropriating funds, $95,000 in building unnecessary roads. And uh, he also accused him of running illegal saloons all throughout the park for the soldiers and for corruptible people. Okay, So all these saloons were running wild open here in Yellowstone National Park. He also accused Major Pitcher of letting a renegade bear run loose in Yellowstone that would attack people camping out in their tents. Because, according to Fullerton, Pitcher was in cahoots with Harry Child who ran the park concessions. Harry Ch uh, Child ran the Yellowstone Park Company, which ran all the transportation and had built all those fine hotels that we see in Yellowstone today, Lake Hotel, Old Faithful Inn. Okay. He accused Child and Pitcher of letting this bear run loose because it would attack the people camping outside and that way it forces them to camp at the hotels. <laughs> That's one smart bear. Yeah. <laughs> Not to do a cartoon on that. Just, uh. So anyway, Fullerton basically attacked a lot of people that worked closely with Theodore Roosevelt. So Harry Child, the president of Yellowstone Park Company, uh, like I said, this guy basically ran the transportation and the hotels within the park. And this was kind of a, a necessary evil for Yellowstone. Early on, they realized they couldn't just open it up to all free enterprise and have all these people show up and build hotels and, and businesses for tourists, or we would turn into another Niagara Falls. It would be a mess. So the federal government supervised which monopolies, which businesses went in into business there in Yellowstone, and they regulated those to make sure that they were providing good services. Okay. And Harry Child uh, was pretty reputable throughout the park. Okay. Major John A. Pitcher, I mentioned, was the acting superintendent from 1901 to 1907. Roosevelt had met him when Roosevelt traveled through Yellowstone um, 
after a hunting trip down in the thoroughfare country, he had traveled through Yellowstone in the early 1890s and was stuck in a snowstorm with Major Pitcher, and they huddled around a campfire sharing stories with one another until the storm passed. And uh, when he became president, of course, he worked with him in the management of Yellowstone. Uh, General Samuel Baldwin Marks, this guy will come in later, we'll talk about him, but he was superintendent of Yellowstone from 1907 to 1908. And this was the first, don't let the military title fool you, but this was the first civilian appointed to be superintendent since the military had taken over in 1886. He was retired. Okay, so from 1886 until young, all those superintendents worked for the acting superintendents worked for the War Department. Young was retired, and he answered directly to the president, basically. Okay, and then uh, Thomas Elwood Hofer, I'll bring him up in a little bit. He was known popularly as Uncle Billy, and he was Roosevelt's hunting guide. Okay, so it was actually Hofer who came in and investigated Fullerton's claim. Now, I thought this was really kind of a, a telling uh, story about Roosevelt's leadership qualities because instead of sending out nasty press releases, this is before tweets, <laughs> instead of berating this guy as being insane or crazy, he actually sent Hofer out there to check the accusations and see what's going on with this guy. Hofer investigated, he interviewed Fullerton, and Fullerton told him all these wild accusations, and, well, and Hofer made the connection. He said, you know, the accusations he's making sound very similar to accusations that were made by our friend E.C. Waters, who runs the Steamboat Concession. Remember the $95,000 misappropriation for road? The main concern about that particular stretch of road is it would bypass the Steamboat Concession. So visitors wouldn't have to ride the boat across the lake. They could stay on the stagecoach. Okay? And again, Waters said, child's controlling the park. He's running it through pitcher. They're trying to put me out of business. And it looks like he put Fullerton up to making all these wild accusations in the newspapers. Even though um, Hofer basically said Fullerton his accusations are, are incorrect. Roosevelt decided, you know, I'm going to be in Yellowstone. I'm going to basically check this out for myself. He actually investigated what was going on in Yellowstone. So he traveled through the park in the spring of 1903. Of course, this would have driven, uh, driven waters absolutely nuts because here on these photographs, so you can see on the sleigh ride here, the guy that's on the right of the photograph with the mustache, that's Harry Child, okay? The guy that's poking up behind Roosevelt's shoulder here, that's Billy Hofer, okay? So we have two people here that are connected to Waters and his accusations and Fullerton and his accusations, and Roosevelt is talking to them during this visit. And you can imagine that he's getting an earful about Waters and his steamboat concessions and all the complaints that have been generated by his mismanagement of this site. So after Roosevelt dedicates the arch and he leaves Yellowstone, he basically gives Major Pitcher free reign to run Waters out of the park, okay? The first big step and driving waters out is to get rid of the steamboat concession, which was quite popular. And you know, people enjoyed this nice ride across the lake, especially after a dusty ride in a stagecoach. But anyway, they went about this basically saying we need to bring in another concessionaire to run a steamboat franchise to produce competition. If we bring competition in the park, that'll drive the prices down. Waters will not be able to charge these unfair rates. Okay, Waters reacted by saying, you know what, I'm going to bring in an even bigger steamboat, the E.C. Waters, which will hold 500 passengers. Okay, the first boat held about 75. This was going to hold 500. The boat, we just found this out thanks to the research by Leslie Quinn, who works up in Yellowstone, but we did find out the boat actually passed its safety inspection. 
Um, oftentimes you'll hear that oh, the boat was deemed unsafe and it wasn't allowed on the water, but it did pass an official inspection. But despite this, Pitcher said, no, we're not going to grant you an extension to your concession to put more people on the boat. And so Waters basically beached the EC Waters boat on Stevenson Island and it sat there and sat there and sat there and you can see it here in this ruinous state. You can still see the remains of this today if you take the boat tour and go by Stevenson Island you'll see the the ribbing of the ship sticking above the water line and the prop as well sticking up above there. So eventually it was set on fire because it was such a, an eyesore as you can see here. But anyway, Waters lost his steamboat concession basically. He fumed and fumed and once again he uh, decided he would go on the attack. So he continued to press Fullerton. Fullerton continued traveling through the country even though he uh, had been deemed as a unreliable resource by Hofer. So he continued traveling around the country spreading his crusade that Roosevelt was supporting all these illegal saloons in Yellowstone. And he was failing to dis, uh, display, or uh, failing to displace Pitcher as manager of the park. Fullerton, however, so at this time, after Waters was starting to lose the steamboat concession, Fullerton ran into problems as well. Fullerton attacked his son-in-law with a pitchfork and tried to kill him, according to the Billings Gazette. So a trial was held to consider if Fullerton was sane. And in this proceeding, they declared that Fullerton was indeed insane, and they committed him to the state, asylum, state insane asylum in Montana there. Fullerton's defense was, I'm not insane, I'm just mean. <laughs> okay, they didn't quite buy that. When asked about his accusations against Pitcher, he said the following. He winked and said, I was no fool. I was paid for it. So who paid him? Well, I know a lot of people like Pitcher and Roosevelt suspected Waters. Waters was financing his moves across the country to basically bring attention to all these supposed problems in the park. And in fact, in one of the meetings, Fullerton had noted to the audience that he was supported by people with deep pockets and he would continue his crusade. It was well funded and he would keep saying everything he could against the president's administration. Oh. So the next, I love technology. I told Corey if it didn't work, I'd blame him. So where are you, Corey? Oh, he's right there. Okay. So the other uh, feature that Waters developed in Yellowstone that um, I consider to be probably one of the lowest points in the management of wildlife within Yellowstone National Park. After creating a steamboat concession, Waters contracted with Charles Goodnight down in Texas to secure some bison that he brought up to the park and he put in enclosures, as you see here, on Dot Island in the middle of Yellowstone Lake. Because God knows there's not enough wildlife to see in Yellowstone. It's great to see them in pins when you're on a steamboat and they're stuck on this island. He also acquired some elk, some antelope, all sorts of different wild animals that he put on display here for people from the steamboat to basically stop, walk around these pins and see the wonderful wildlife, okay? When he lost the steamboat concession, Waters decided to use these animals to strike back at the park military administration. He stopped feeding them. He stopped cleaning the pins. Not only the pins for these wild animals, which by the way, these would winter, next to Lake Hotel with all of Waters' domestic livestock. And keep in mind, all the domestic livestock and these animal pens are right next to Lake Hotel and they're not being cleaned. You can imagine the complaints that were being generated by the people staying at Lake Hotel, okay? So anyway, 
At this point in time, General Young had taken over Yellowstone National Park and basically said to Waters, get rid of these animals, turn them loose. We're not going to allow you to run this zoo anymore. Waters held the animals hostage. He said, no, I tell you what, I got a counteroffer. I'll sell these to the government. And he started naming a price. He brought in his attorney and they started negotiating. And at this time, Waters was really working Washington, D.C. through his Republican contacts and putting a lot of pressure on um, Roosevelt to do something. But it was great because whenever Roosevelt would receive a letter from somebody saying, you've got to give Waters a fair deal, he's being mistreated by the Park Administration, he would say, well, let me tell you, Waters and this guy Fullerton have been creating a lot of problems here, and I know from firsthand experience what they've been doing, so I'm not going to take action to protect Waters and his leases, his concessions within Yellowstone National Park. This basically gives General Young free reign to drive the animals out of Yellowstone. So on uh, October 15, 1907, General Young orders the park the military to basically turn the animals loose. They tear down the pens, they tear down Waters' pens in their lake hotel, and uh, they turn these animals loose. Waters was really upset. He threatened to sue the government for the loss of uh, the, his assets there, these wonderful animals he was going to sell to the government. And uh, basically, Young pointed out that these people, these animals had been mistreated. In fact, um, one complaint about the treatment of these animals, I'll read this to you. But one guy accused Waters of feeding the hungry animals, picked out, uh, the animals fed them potato peelings, pieces of vegetables, bits of meat, the filthy corrals, the noisome odors, and the sight of elk fed like hogs on stale garbage disgusted several of the passengers. So these animals were not in very healthy condition. Now as a side, this connects us to Buffalo Bill here. You know I had to get Buffalo Bill in here some way. So all of the wildlife just kind of faded away. You know, all of Waters' animals disappeared, except for this mean bison bull that kept causing problems around lake and charging people, scaring them off. So Young came up with a brilliant idea. He ordered the soldiers to drive the buffalo up over Sylvan Pass into the valley of the North Fork of the Shoshone, where Buffalo Bill had recently completed Pahaska Teepee, his hunting lodge. So I don't know what happened to this bison bull, but uh, I have a feeling he didn't last very long. I often look at the bison skull that's on the fireplace in the old lodge at Pahaska Teepee and wonder if that was the, because they tell you it's the last buffalo Buffalo Bill killed. The tour guides up there tell you that, but I'm, I'm not sure it may have been this bull that Waters had brought in. Anyway, Waters is driven out of the park uh, Roosevelt left the White House, President Taft took over, and believe it or not, President Taft considered bringing Waters back into Yellowstone and turning him loose again. Uh, a lot of people wrote angry letters, and basically they put an end to it. Waters did not return to the park. Uh, you'll never guess who got the boat concessions in Yellowstone. Uncle Billy Hofer. You can see why Waters was really kind of thinking, I, I'm, being, I'm being, you know, conspired against here by the Roosevelt administration. So Child and, and Hofer are really sticking it to me here. So Hofer took over the boat concessions. Eventually they were bought out by Child, and they became part of the Yellowstone Park company. So uh, Waters had lost his control of his uh, concessions there in Yellowstone. Fullerton... He served for a brief time in the, uh, the insane asylum in Montana, and then eventually he went up to Canada and lived in Vancouver for a while where he started growing elderberries. He became known as Elderbe Elderberry Fullerton by the locals. So he became a pretty successful gardener up there. But in 1912, he published his autobiography. And this is the preface of the book here. When I started at the request of a large number of friends to write this book, I determined to tell the truth no matter who was hit. Okay. Again, you have to wonder what role is Waters playing in supporting this book. Also, the date this is released is very interesting. Okay. As a former 
history instructor, I got to give you a quick test. What was going on in 1912 that involved Roosevelt? The Bull Moose Party. So Roosevelt was running for another term in office under the Progressive Party, the Bull Moose Party. He was running against President Taft, and he was running against Woodrow Wilson. Okay, and I'll let the cat out of the bag. Woodrow Wilson won. Sorry to ruin the ending here. So, but anyway, this book came out in 1912, which is really interesting. It comes out during a campaign year, and basically, again, Fullerton makes the accusations but at this point in time, they become even more sensational. Now, for example, he talks about traveling through Fort Washakie in one of his trips, and he says all the soldiers there were joking about Roosevelt the Rough Rider. They said he wasn't even at San Juan Hill. He was in the tent reading dispatches. Okay? So this Rough Rider hero, he wasn't even there. Well, he gets that out in the autobiography. He now claims the visit, which, by the way, um, they had proved that Roosevelt was sick the day Fullerton was in Washington, D.C. and never met with this guy, even about the agricultural substation. So he never met Roosevelt, but in, according to the autobiography here, he sat down with Roosevelt and he accused Pitcher of all these things, and Roosevelt slams down his fist and says, I will not have you talk about my friend John Pitcher that way, and orders him out of the office, and he basically says, if you say anything, we're going to handle you like we handled those rustlers up in Johnson County. And so he walks out meek and mild and continues to do his best to try and put an end to all the alcohol and all the killing of wildlife in Yellowstone. But then secret agents are sent out by Roosevelt who poison his own family members against him. And these are the ones that basically commit Fullerton to the asylum, his own family that had been turned against him by Roosevelt's agents. He manages to escape the insane asylum. I don't know if you noticed on his headstone there, the Masonic square and compass. He said he used his Masonic connections, his secret Masonic signs, made friends. He escaped from the asylum, fled to Canada, where he's been hiding out ever since. Okay, <laughs> Sensational story, kind of fizzled. Didn't really take off. This book is really hard to find today. Um, it's, you can't even access it on Google Books. It's so rare. So I have one. I have a copy here. It's past due from the library. I'll get that back to you, Mary. <laughs> so. so anyway, the legacy of all this. So today when you go to Yellowstone, the Roosevelt Arch welcomes tourists traveling through the north entrance. Of course, there's Roosevelt Lodge where it is near Tower Junction, which offers a variety of accommodation and imparts stories of Roosevelt's Yellowstone legacy, some of which may be true. I've heard all sorts of great things about Roosevelt. He's given credit for founding the National Park, for the National Park Service, all sorts of things. Not quite true. An anchor from the steamboat E.C. Waters is on display at Bridge Bay Arena. Of course, the remains of the steamboat are still on Stevenson Island. And these two remnants today remind visitors of idyllic images of steamboats escorting Victorian tourists across Yellowstone Lake. Most visitors today do not see the ruins of the animal pens on Dot Island, established by Waters in his attempts to display natural wildlife in a zoo setting. The Yellowstone heritage of Waters and his concession is arguably broken apart and lies in ruins. James Fullerton's autobiography remains out of print and is rarely referenced in the many Roosevelt biographies in print. Now, on the other hand, Roosevelt's influence and legacy over Yellowstone eclipse the concessionaire and the insane adversary. This result is the outcome uh, not only of this struggle between Waters and Fullerton and Roosevelt regarding the proper administration of Yellowstone, which again redefined the phrase for the benefit and enjoyment of the people. In his effort to remove waters from Yellowstone National Park and his support of the military administration, Roosevelt basically raised the question of professional standards guiding both administrators and concessions in Yellowstone National Park and later shaped the National Park Service's efforts to control monopolies within Yellowstone. 
Roosevelt's intervention also promulgated and publicized the outstanding, outstanding opportunity for visitors to view wildlife within the park in a natural setting instead of zoo-like displays. Roosevelt's defeat of Waters in Fullerton greatly diminished and set continuing precedent against federal oversight ensuring Yellowstone National Park benefits only the few at the expense of the greater good who continue to enjoy the park all that has to offer. Now, I do also want to note, kind of as a sidelight here, something that stemmed from this, this conflict. Roosevelt did seriously question the role of the military administration in Yellowstone. And I think this episode, one of his biggest concerns was how people were able to manipulate other politicians to try and control the military's actions within the park and how that allowed someone like Waters to stay there for a while. So one of the things he had General Young do during his term as superintendent of Yellowstone is begin a study. This study was to determine the feasibility of transferring Yellowstone National Park from the military to what Roosevelt referred to as a civilian park guard. That was the first step towards the creation of the National Park Service, which occurred under President Woodrow Wilson's administration in 1916. So as you travel through Yellowstone today and cross through the, the archway here, you're well reminded of Roosevelt's legacy. And fortunately, you have not been reminded about Waters and Fullerton's legacy. Thank you. <laughs>